Our webinar is live. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Happy Tuesday and welcome to another fantastic edition of The Lunchroom. Uh, so excited to be back with you again. We took last week off, I believe. I missed you. Yeah. I missed you, Mark. I mean... <laughs> When, when's the last time you and I have done this together? I think it was June 1st with the Queen, the Queens from Six. Oh, of course. Of course, Six. Yeah. Yes. How Which, could I forget? I don't know. I think it's because it. spring celebration just like created such a like blackout in my memory that... A thematic time to today's programming, as it turns out. So here we are. I uh, knew you were going to catch me up. <laughs> I, you know, I knew it. You, it's almost like you can read my mind. It's almost like we've been friends for a decade at this point. But <laughs> we are so excited to have everyone here again for a fantastic special edition of The Lunchroom, our second to last for the fiscal year, but, or the year. And that's just my development brain working in fiscal <laughs> years now. I'm in converted. Sorry, everyone. Uh, but we will be back. Never fear. Uh, I'm Sarah Schofield Manser. I am ART's Assistant Director of Special Events and Partnerships. I use the she series of pronouns. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the land of the Massachusetts, Pentucket, Wabanaki, and Penticook peoples, a little bit north of Boston, and that the land that the Low Drama Center and Oberon occupy is unceded territory of the Massachusetts people as well. I'm going to give a short visual description of myself. I am a white woman with dark brown hair. It looks a lot darker on camera. That's a very petty thing to say. It's just something I've been dealing with for the past few years silently. Um, I'm wearing today a red blouse with a, a black shirt underneath. I've got headphones in and I've got my very plain yellow walled background behind me. I'm going to turn it over to Mark for an intro before I take it back for some housekeeping. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Mark Lunsford here. He, him, his. Good to see you. Um, I'm the artistic producer at ART. Um, very happy to be back in the lunchroom chair today. The, the, the chair has moved. Uh, at least mine has. Um, I am uh, in Ohio today. Um, we're sort of a we're sort of a um, transcontinental uh, group today, which you know, we'll hear more about when Christina brings us. But um, very happy to be back. Uh, I'm a, a white man um, with a, a brown beard, mustache, and hair, wearing a black polo buttoned to the top, um, sitting in my mom's office with a white door behind me and sort of mauve walls. Um, <laughs> Excited to be here, excited for summer to be here, um, officially birthday of summer yesterday, which is really great. Um, and I uh, get to be with you next week as well for a, a really special episode um, before we take a little summer vacation. Sarah and I are going to an island for two months oh. to plan lunchroom domination, syndication, get ready. Great, you're, you're hearing it here first folks with me. It's gonna be amazing, <laughs> surprise vacation, we love it. Uh, as Mark said, we're so happy to have you. We love the lunchroom. It's actually really nice, Mark, to have a different background. I feel like it's, you know, it's just like a little spice Change on it up. top. Change yeah. it up. Why not? You've seen my wall for the past nine months. Uh, a couple of bits of Zoom housekeeping before we get to the good stuff. The first being that you will notice that the chat, as always, is disabled. We do encourage you to submit questions for Mark and Christina using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit it any time during the hour, but know that we will reserve the last 15 minutes or so to answer your questions. So please submit them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to follow along with live subtitles, we have the Zoom auto-generated subtitles available. You can turn those on by clicking a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It should have three dots and say more. And depending on sort of the, uh, the Zoom update that you have, it will either give you an option to show a subtitle or show a live transcript. So you can turn that on if you'd like to follow along at home with that. And last, but absolutely and certainly not least, I'd like to read ART's anti-racism commitment statement. The ART is unequivocally opposed to hate, and we center anti-racism as a core value. We expect everyone in the ART community, including our audiences, to uphold these values, and as such, we will not tolerate anti-Blackness or racism of any kind in our buildings nor at our online events. We aim to create an environment that is uninhabitable to racism and to discrimination for all BIPOC staff, artists, volunteers, audience, and community are seen, heard, valued and given an opportunity to thrive. This work is only possible when we do it together. So thank you as our audience for being our partner in it. Mark, I'm gonna do okay. the thing I do best every week. I'm gonna go off camera, but I'll be waiting in the wings if you need me. Have a great lunch from everyone and we will see you next week. Great, thanks Sarah. Um, yes, very, very thrilled to be with you all today. And, um, you know, 
Christina and I have been talking a, a little bit, um, trying to find um, time to, to have her on because we, you know, audiences may remember Christina from Burn All Night, but um, her and I have stayed in touch and and had a lot of different artistic conversations and pursuits and, and stayed very connected. So I was just really looking forward to the opportunity to speak with her. So without further ado, Christina, will you join me here in the in the lunchroom? Hi, everyone. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so exciting. Um, why don't you introduce yourself for folks at home? Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Christina Alabato. She, her, hers. Um, I'm calling in from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm visiting my dad here for a week. Um, it's like 120 degrees. It's crazy. Wow. Um, I'm a first generation Mexican Lebanese woman. That is how I identify. And um, I'm super happy to be here. I love ART. I can't wait to talk with you, Mark. Um, some of my best memories are working at the Oberon and with ART in all of you know the development with we live in Cairo and all the things that we've done together yeah. over here. So I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. And that's what I was saying. We're kind of uh, uh, you know spread across the country today. <laughs> I'm in Ohio, you're in Arizona, and you were just telling me you're you're singing the national anthem at the Diamondbacks game tonight. I am. I'm so excited. It's always been something that I've wanted to do. I'm a huge baseball fan, and it's hard because I'm never here long enough to like make it work with them. And this time, I just ran. I emailed them, and I was like, "Do you happen to have a slot available?" And they were like, "Yes, come do it." So I'm so excited to do that tonight. And I love baseball, so I get to go see the game. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm I'm a baseball nut. You know, big Cincinnati Reds fan. Um, and I don't really get to watch them in Boston, so that's been a, a huge part of my television diet while I've been home is just watching press games. Fun. Yeah, they're they're on the road though. Every time I'm home this summer, which is like that's a bummer, but. Okay. Yeah, I haven't been to like, this is probably the biggest event I will have gone to tonight in like a year and a half. So I'm a little like nervous to be around that many people, but it'll be great. <laughs> I went to Fenway um, maybe two or three weeks ago, and it was still like very limited capacity. Um, but at the same time, I was like, this is also great. <laughs> oh, yes. I mean, you know, you're spread out. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm so, it, it's always so great to, to catch up and to chat. And, and that's what I was saying, you know, I feel like we only got to do one production together, yeah. but I feel like you and I, like ever since then, we've just been connected on lots of different kind of artistic pursuits. And this always felt very like on the same wavelength artistically. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, there's so much I want to, I want to dig into, but a lot of times in the lunchroom, we have, um, folks watching, um, you know, who are high school students or um, sort of early in their career and their life journey who are really interested in uh, performance. And I think we often sort of get stuck in like a very prescribed path that folks seem to follow. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk about like just how you got your start, because I think there's just so many different ways folks get into this business. And, and yeah. I would love for you to talk a little bit about just how you what sort of motivated you to be a performer and, and what that journey and what that path was for you to start? Absolutely. So I, um, I'm from Phoenix where I'm at now. And um, you, you are right that like, I've spoken to a lot of students and young people pursuing this over the time of the pandemic. One of the, you know, amazing gifts that this has given us is access to each other that we didn't have before because of Zoom. So I'm always like a glass half full person. So I've been able to talk to a lot more people um, than I ever have um, in just being in New York. And you are right. The path for any artist, actor, any in any position is so different for each person. And for me, I'm from Phoenix. I was born and raised here. Um, I loved singing in Arizona. I started as a singer and then I transitioned into musical theater because it was you know, the easiest way for me to sing. And then I learned about musical theater and musicals. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I want to do. Um, and when I was in my last year of high school, um, I'll tell you like my little journey story into it. I was watching the Tonys and I saw Spring Awakening on there, um, which was a huge musical in 2007 in that time frame, um, and I graduated high school in 2007. Um, and I remember watching the Tonys very vividly and I had never been to New York. Like I am like a Chandler girl. Like I had just gotten accepted <laughs> in SU, um, because I didn't have access to going to a bigger program. My family didn't have the capacity to send me anywhere, but my state school. So I was always going to ASU to study theater. And that summer before I saw the Tonys, I was like, that's, I, I had never seen a show that felt so me. And I was like, 
I'm going to be in that show. I literally said that as a 17 year old in Arizona with no context and no and nothing to to say that that could happen for me. So I said, I'm going to be in that show. I've never seen something that much for me that is so right for me. Went to ASU. And then um, I had put in an application to audition for some summer stock and they rejected my application, but I had booked a ticket to Boston to audition for summer stock. Um, And uh, they said no. And then I was crying and my friend was like, Spring Awakening has an open call in Boston on the same day as those auditions. Get out. Really? Same day. Straw hat. It was, it was like a straw hat open call. Um, and I had booked my ticket and I was like, are you serious? So I got on the plane and I went to an open call for spring awakening and I got it. That's amazing. I did not know that part of the (laughs) stuff. It was so crazy. That's how I started. That's like how I got my start. I left school my freshman year. I'm right after the end of my freshman year. And I went on that tour for two years. Um, from 18 to 20. And then I moved to the city. Um, and I gave myself, you know, I said, okay, Christina, like you're only 20. You don't really know what you're doing still, even though you did a big job. I was like, you can give, I was like two years, two years in New York. If you don't book another big job, you're going back to school. Um, and then I got my Broadway debut six months later in the Green Day musical, American Idiot. And then incredible. I've kept going since then. And it's been an amazing, you know, 13 years living in New York. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, it's such a, it's such a good sort of lesson in, um, not resilience, but like, just like committing and going for it. Right. Like you got to take the jump and to just have like jumped into that. Um, it's so, that's so cool. Yeah. And in Boston, I didn't know, I didn't know the audition was in Boston. That's kind yeah. of serendipitous. I had, I had never been anywhere cold. I remember the audition was in March and I didn't have a coat because I'm from Arizona. And I, I literally was, I had to stand outside. It was snowing to wait for the open call. And I was in like a jean jacket because I didn't, I didn't understand what Boston cold was. Um, well, so, it's also a special brand of cold, so. <laughs> totally. Um, but yeah, I was like number five. I got there really early and yeah. So I'll never forget that. That always, I like telling that story now because it does remind me of just like the, you like I always remind people like you, our dreams, ha- I want, my dreams were that strong. And I know that can sound mm-hmm. cheesy and stuff, but I had a real like, this is what I want to do. And with a lot of work and persistence and stuff, I mean, it ended up happening for me, but I continued studying when I got to New York. I took a lot of classes and I had learned a lot on tour. I kind of learned by doing really. Yeah. I mean, I think that's it's so important because I, I, I don't know if this was your experience living in Arizona, but it was certainly my experience in Ohio. It's it, just like understanding that there is like a lot of work and that there is an industry and that there is a business and that there are sort of opportunities beyond exactly being on the Broadway stage. I think it was, it's just something that, I certainly didn't understand totally when I was growing up. Um, oh, no, it's hard sometimes, I think, to explain the sort of breadth of the industry that we work in for folks and, uh, and all the opportunities that exist. Oh, totally. I always tell young people, like, Broadway can be your dream. And it's, I love that I've been on Broadway. I've been on Broadway three times. I knock on wood about it all the time. But when I add up the amount of months that I've been on, you know, I've done this for 13 years professionally. That's when I booked Spring Awakening. And my time on a Broadway stage kind of probably amounts to like no more than two years. So what am I doing in between two years over 13 years? And I've been working the whole time, but there's so much, there's so much to do in what we do. That's not just on a Broadway stage. Um, And I think that's really powerful because there's so much theater and art being made. Um, And then you end up doing things that mean as much as doing an incredible Broadway show or, um, and different than you ever thought and doing things that I would have never expected. Like I do voices on cartoons on TV. Like I never thought that that was something I would do and I love it. It's something that's a huge part of my career that brings me a lot of joy. So, um, yeah, everybody's journey really is super different and there's so many like avenues and ways you can turn and you look back and you're like, wow, I've had a full, amazing 13 years of doing all types of incredible work. Um, both developmental and like on a big Broadway stage. So it's been pretty special. Wow. Yeah, I want to I wanna dig, dig into that de- developmental piece a little bit because, you know, that's in, in, in a couple of cases, that's how you and I have gotten to know each other. Um, and particularly with Burn All Night, um, a, a musical for those who are watching who may not remember that we did. Um, I should have looked this up beforehand, but I think it was in 2016. Yes. Might have- 17, 2017, because I got 2017. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay, great. 
Yeah. So, um, so in 2017, um, which, you know, was, uh, a year in to many of us feeling like we might be in the end times. Um, and with a musical about, uh, about sort of what would happen at the end of the world, right? What would, what would that reveal to us? Um, with a synth pop score, because of course that's, <laughs> um, but you know, it was such a, uh, special unique piece, um, and, and so much fun. Um, and we got to do it in Oberon in this sort of immersive setting. So, you know, so much to dig into, but I wonder, talk a little bit about like what that Oberon moment was. Like, had you done an immersive musical like this before? Had you been in relationship with the audience in that way before? And, and what was great about that? What did you not like about it? What was that experience like? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I, you know this, Mark, but for all of you listening, Burn All Night was like one of my favorite experiences I've ever had as an actor, as an artist, as a person. I had so much fun doing that show. I had so much fun with the like freedom of creativity and development that ART offers to actors and writers. And, um, and then also just the addition of an, an immersive experience, which I had never done anything like that before. Um, and I always thought I would like it, but I never realized how much, especially in the context of Burn All Night, where we were in a club. For those of you that didn't see Burn All Night, it took place a lot of the time um, in a club in the show. And so we used Oberon as the literal space that it was. Um, and I still daydream about doing it again. It was so much fun to dance with the audience, to go to the bar and get a drink with the audience, like to just experience like the music and the synth pop score, like as if you were there. I mean, I, I think that unlocked a lot of really cool, um, I don't know, just for me as an actor speaking about that, like just a lot of cool, like experiencing something truly lived in the space. Um, and you don't feel that so much. I feel that when I do TV and film, cause like you're literally in it, but sometimes with the mm. scene, you lose, you know, you lose perspective quickly. Cause you're like, Oh, the audience, but in the Oberon, you're like, I'm doing a scene with Lincoln where we're yelling at each other in the club while I'm standing next to two people dancing with their drinks. Like it was just so I, I will never get over how fun that was ever like, and yeah. moving, as at the end, like it is about the end of the world and what happens. And just to have everybody with us the whole time. I don't know. I freaking loved it. I wish we could do it again right now. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, maybe soon. Um, it's, it's also because you get that moment with the audience. Like they don't get to sit in anonymity. Right. So like you're having that argument with Lincoln and then you could just like stare audience over stick. <laughs> like you're in this, you know. Exactly. Um, but it was just it was uh, the experience from start to finish was just so mm. cool. And like. You know, I'd known Andy Mantis, who was one of the writers for so many years because we did Spring Awakening together when we were kids. And um, I had done like an, a reading of Burn All Night in our hotel room when I was 19. Um, like the first draft that he ever wrote, like just sitting, you know, wow. after a show. And so for it to come full circle and for me to actually be able to play Holly um, after all those years was just really amazing. And I can't say enough, and you know this, Mark, but just the freedom at ART. I just feel like you guys have such an amazing, like, place for creativity and I felt that way when we were workshopping we live in Cairo as well in New York just you know it's just so much like just you give the time for the artists to flesh things out in a way that sometimes can feel very rushed um mm. and I've really I love everything I've done with you guys no I mean I think um you know I, I remember the auditions for for Bernal Night and sitting in the room and of course Andy was there and and um just where you came in he was like okay everyone get ready you know, and then of course we were blown away because, and I think it, it's a little bit what you were talking about. Like, um, I have always appreciated your work so much because you're such a like singer, which is it's, it's not meant in any way like a slight to music theater performers, but you just have like a voice that is so your own that you're so in command of and control of. Yeah. And I felt like that was like a lot of burn all night. Like there were so many different kinds of voices in that room, but also just like honored that pop score in a way, right? That like allowed it to depart from what traditional music theater scores might have what we think they might sound like or what we think they're supposed to do right right I feel like my career kind of I've floated more in that world like I you know in the reason Spring Awakening felt so right for me at the time was because I always sort of felt like my voice was more in a pop world um and now with the way musical theater is I mean it's just you know it's really fun to watch the medium kind of change and then for to be so many different genres now um 
But, you know, having done like a punk musical and I did the David Bowie musical and I did Stephen Trask's new musical. And so I've really kind of lingered in all these pop rock scores, um, American Psycho with Duncan Sheik. And then to land in Mean Girls was really fun to kind of go back to like traditional musical theater, but still pop. Um, yeah. All these like, and, you know, like just all these like really intense like dramas, like mm -hmm. um, even the last thing before I did Mean Girls was We Live in Cairo. Like and then to go into like a musical comedy for the first time in my whole career was very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to kind of talk about that some more because, you know, um, Brittle Night was a sort of original piece. We Live in Cairo is the original piece. But I've also like you've done so many really exciting projects that have such deep pop cultural references um you know certainly american psycho certainly mean girls um and even american idiot you know while i think that was this sort of original concept that that, that album has such resonance in the pop culture world lazarus is like, so i wanted to talk a little bit about like as a performer is there not only the sort of duty and responsibility felt to honor the composer and honor the writer and honor the intention right and 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 flesh out this character really give this character life but then also is there this added like pressure because of what an audience is not going to expect because they they have a sense of what they know the story to be or they know this piece to be totally i think i felt that the most palpably in mean girls because Gretchen Wieners is so iconic and yeah. that's, that's just so iconic. And it was iconic to me. I'm a huge fan of that movie. I, before I was ever associated with it, I've watched it 45 million times. I, I loved that movie. Um, and uh, so, yes, there's an, an aspect of going into these shows that do have this expectation where you go, how do I make this my own? But how do I also just do it without also feeling like I have to change it so that I'm not the same? Like it is this balance. Yeah. Um, I feel that way when I'm a replacement as well. And I replaced in this show. So it was a double whammy trying to pay homage to the person that came before you, but also make it your own, um, but not force it to be different just to be different. So it is this kind of, you know, um, back and forth, but I think, yeah, you're right. I have done, you know, American psycho is a very specific, very, you know, difficult show for some people. It didn't last very long, but it had, you know, all those cultural, like, just and anyone that saw the movie and um it's been interesting to work on stuff like that i've also developed quite a few things like i was in development for tootsie which was a movie and what i was um in development for devil wears prada i played andy for a while in that um and so a lot of like these pop culture shows that become musicals it is interesting to sort of excavate them for the stage and I, I don't think it, the best versions of them are the ones where you go in and try not to make a carbon copy and i think that mm. that's where um the development of these shows have been fun because at least in my experience no one has tried to do that it's about trying to again pay homage to the past also try to change it so that it can be better now like a lot of these things are from a long time ago and need updating and tina fey did a great job updating you know some of the mean girl stuff and um so yeah it's been really it's been really fun for me i love working on material like that but i also love the new stuff i i've done so much original mm -hmm development um and so that has been really that's it's all very it's all different but sort of you know it feels like such a creative process and a team effort on all of it i think that too it's with the, with the particular um pieces that don't have a musical center necessarily right like it, rob devil or prada um mean girls certainly they have a, a musical aesthetic in the underscoring whatever in the movie but to to use music as a storytelling function I feel like we were seeing that in, in Waitress too, right? Like there becomes this new layer that is doing these same things. It's trying to capture what people remember, but also trying to sort of redefine or reveal something in this piece that maybe didn't come through in the in the in the original treatment. Exactly. I think Gretchen Gretchen Wieners is a perfect example of that. Um, for anyone that's seen the show, I think one of the most successful uses of song to expand a character that you thought you knew is actually my song in Mean Girls called What's Wrong With Me. Um, you know, the plastics are the plastics, but you have this one moment of vulnerability for one of them that's really helpful with like why, you know, bullies are the way they are or why this person feels victim, like actually victimized by Regina George in a real way, not just like a victimized by Regina George, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and, you know, I had a lot of, over the, my year of playing Gretchen, the amount of letters and um at the stage door and people that talked to me that said that song made me feel heard a lot of these younger high school kids even junior high kids that deal with 
not feeling adequate enough in their friend group or whatever. Um, the amount of times that people said that that song, uh, young people said that song really helped them in a difficult time was really cool because you wouldn't necessarily think that that would be something that a kid would walk away from in Mean Girls feeling like I'm heard for the first time, especially from one of the plastics. So um, that was really powerful for me. And I think an incredible addition that Tina and the team did with the show is like showing again on in a musical, you have the time and space with song to add more dimension really like to the to the story yeah i think you know that's something i've also learned i think working with you is that you you do often sort of extend beyond your duty as the character you're someone who really is thinking about like what is the full scope of like the story we're telling here right and like you have the work that you need to do for your character but you're also constantly in in an evaluation of like how that's fitting into everything else and what the writers are trying to do and how you <clears throat> i think that was especially in and we live in Cairo and some of those developmental sessions, right? It was like we were in some some deep conversations, not only about trying to learn the music and give voice to the, the script, but then also to get feedback, like what's working, what isn't working. There's such a burden like for historical accuracy and for um, cultural competency in, in that storytelling that I feel like in a similar ways related to how we treat these adaptations that have these deep pop culture references. Absolutely. And and why I love development is because, you know, when there's time for that, sometimes development is like so quick and dirty. You're like, I don't have, we don't have time to deal with that. And in that context, you know, I've spent so much of my career doing readings. I mean, dozens and hundreds of readings of new musicals and like working through things. And sometimes the process is really fast, but We Live in Cairo is a great example of like having three weeks in a studio where we had time to really talk about what was working, what wasn't like that ability for the writers. You know, I think the thing I've learned as an actor in development is that my job is to, my job is to be there for the writers and the creators. My job is not to be, you know, like, well, I need this to sound good on me. Like it has nothing to do with me really. And there is a person, if they're interested and you're interested in feedback about like, does this work for you as an actor? What do you think about this? Like, is this making sense to you guys? Cause we're really in it. Um, then those conversations can be really helpful. Um, and I think that why I love development is because I really, I love the fact that I get to be there for the creative team. Like, and it's just, mm -hmm. I always tell young people going into development, yes, it can feel pressurized because you're like, well, I, I need to do a good job because I want to stay with this project. But it's really not about the actors. It's really about the piece. So it's a larger scope for me um, when I'm in development stuff. Yeah, you know, and, and I think... Um... Uh, there's sort of a renewed sense of that after this year. Uh, just in terms of what, what, like, what, how, is, how do we make the work and what are we trying to accomplish the work? Um, and there's, you know, the Lazors. I don't think I'm revealing huge state secrets because they've, they've done a behind the scenes episode and talked about this already, but um, they're working on a, on a new, on a new piece that we're developing with them with Baby and certainly like really trying to reject the frame of a musical and mm -hmm. think more like what, what are we wanting to accomplish with, with the audience and partnership with the audience. What does this performance say to the audience, right? And I feel like that's, it's something I'm thinking about a lot after a year of what we do being sort of non-essential, um, quotes very, very much implied, <laughs> uh, uh, important to that. Um, kind of what is our responsibility now as things are opening up and as we are interpreters and storytellers and we do assemble strangers in a room together um i wonder like what's what what's been sticking with you this year so as we sort of have this time to reflect on our process and think about our responsibility as theater makers and and what that brings forward as we look ahead totally i think you know in a very basic way having time away from the stage and away from what i mean defines me you know it's weird you figure out like what who am i and why what is, I think that's been an interesting question that a lot of people have asked themselves during the pandemic is what am I doing and why am I doing it? And, you know, who am I without it? And who do I want to be when I'm back in it? Like, and how do I want to, how do I want to be a part of this, you know, kind of churning machine that never stopped because nothing has ever stopped theater. And now to have a pause and to come back, how can we make it better? And, um, you know, a more open space and all these things. And, you know, on a very basic level, I've realized that I love the stage and I'll never not, you know, I've, I always knew that, but like to get re really re um, ignited with how much I love what I'm doing. Um, but I also think that like, 
as a storyteller, as an actor, as, uh, you know, all these things, all I want to do is be able to share and share stories that people need to hear. And, and also like, you know, be, I, I'm one of those people that like, I want to be patient and I also want to see change in everything that we do as um, a group of storytellers, like you said, artists, um, from the big stages to the regional houses to everything. I just think that collectively, um, I think everyone is listening better. I don't know. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I just, I feel like everyone's dials are turned a little bit in a way that I believe is going to create I mean, I have all the hope in the world is going to create better, more open, honest work than we've ever all done. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, part of that investigation has been not only like it's 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 sort of beyond like the small tweaks in the machine, right? It's more like this reinvestigation of what our relationship is culturally with our society. Totally. Which kind of feels... I, I will say, like, uh, there are plenty of times that feels very daunting, <laughs> um, or, or, or as an, as as an individual, one I think could feel very prepared for for taking that on. Um, there is also something really exciting about it, and reimagining what those possibilities can be. I think so, and I think that we are creators, right? We we should be the ones that are changing the way that it's always been. I mean, you know, I think that, I think that's why I've loved doing new musicals so much and new shows over the years is that, especially like something like the Oberon is such a great example of like trying to change, you know, not feel like you have to stay with the way it's been like, and I know that was on a small scale because, you know, but, but the way that like we took, ch you know, chances and any show that you do at the Oberon is change it, it you know just changing the way that a musical needs to be proscenium whatever and so i think that i think that as creators i'm hopeful that everybody is looking at this larger scope of like how do we make this better and how can we how can we continue this and not just say okay we'll try for a little while but really allow it to be a long lasting process of change and growth and um excavation of why we did things the way we did and how we're going to make it better in the future. Um, and I think that, you know, that, there, that takes time. And so I mm. think like you said, no one, maybe some people weren't quite equipped for like those huge conversations. And I think that it, you know, just having the time to process and realize that we have the power to make major changes and connect in ways that we never did. Um, I think that's, that can be really powerful. And I'm very hopeful that that, and that there's just a lot of, you know, amazing new things happening. Well, and don't you think too, in the theater, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've talked about this a lot in uh, my time, I think, but there's a particular opportunity because there are so many seats for so many different artists at the table, so many different kinds of interpreters, um, like that hyper collaborative nature of the theater, I think presents a very special opportunity not to take anything away from our other performance disciplines or our disciplines, but there is something in that um, in that sort of melting of those of those disciplines together that I feel like it's a, a, a different kind of opportunity. Oh yeah, I, I totally think so, and I think that, like you said, like not having it for a little while has been interesting to say. Like, why do we do the the sh why do we do theater? Why do what is the opportunity we have with a live audience? Like, you know, just continuing to ask ourselves like what how can we continue just molding and growing and you know given that we have like you said this opportunity of connection that's unlike connecting on camera and unlike connecting in these other mediums as artists but stage and live performance is so specific and offers us such an opportunity so what we're going to do with that in the future is i'm very excited to see um what happens with all that um so i'm going to take us back to burn all night a little bit um because you know <laughs> Sarah, uh, Sarah was, um, uh, Sarah and I bartended at O'Brien, she was a bartender during Brown Night, and, like, they've always been a bop, we have so many fond memories, um, but I always wonder for actors, you know, because you are right there with the audience, and because in Brown Night, I think we were, like, serving beer and red solo cups, like, we were really going in on oh, the sort of, like, <laughs> college party aesthetic, right? Did you ever have a moment where you were sort of out in the audience and a scene through that you weren't in, so you were sort of watching a scene and 
something was just happening in the audience that was like very distracting. <laughs> like, just I, it's weird. Like I think like so the biggest part of you know in that show that we were like really with the audience was that whole club sequence where I'm on the cube. Yeah. All the like, and me and Lincoln are dancing, and we do like we bang the title song, Bruno Night. Um, and it's funny that was the most interaction I have with the audience in the show. And I think because the whole that whole sequence was so overstimulating, as both the actor and probably the audience member, the lighting was amazing, it was so like booming, like the music was just driving, and like, and then our dancing that we were doing, and we were dancing within the audience, and I, Everything was so overstimulated that, like, if something weird was happening, I would have never known because <laughs> I'm so, so honestly fully immersed in the experience of, like, which is why I think, again, it's just such a cool experience for me, someone that's not a method actor, to feel like I just was doing exactly what we were supposed to be doing in the musical was just so cool. Um, but no, every once in a while, the big issue was always like, someone was in my way of someone lifting me on the cube or getting off. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to step on this person. Like there are certain little things, but like yeah. just figure it out. And I'm always just like, I want to make sure these people have a good experience and that I don't that, you know, but we had such a good system put in of like, you know, certain cast members clearing a path in a way, like it was all so choreographed. Um, but we always had so much fun every once in a while when Lincoln and I, we had a, a piece of a song where we were just at the bar and we were talking and dancing and just like, and we were there for a little while, I think like maybe two minutes, which is a long time to stay in the same place. Every once in a while, people would like start talking to us, like really talking to us. And I was like, oh, oh, I just sort of ignore you, but I totally want to hang out with you and party and drink beer at a red solo cup with you. <laughs> it was funny because I would always be like very protective of the bartenders. Like, I don't want the bartenders to feel like they have to be in the show, that they have to be interacting. You know, like I don't, that's not their job. Or the, and I was so wrong about it because by the time we got to these scenes where you guys were at the bar for a couple couple minutes, the bartenders were like, yeah, I'm going to pour them a drink. I'm going to like have a conversation with them. I'm in it. It was so, <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, we would get like shots from the bartenders, probably maybe once from you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, and and they were so fun, all the bartenders. Yeah, they had a blast. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's particularly funny because I know a lot of times we're trying to figure out how to recreate that audience interaction. And I know that Sam Pinkleton and Jenny Coons, choreographer, director, respectively, I remember this rehearsal um, specifically, where there were probably like 20 of us on staff between production and producing whatever. And they were trying to like demonstrate for everyone what it would be like when the dance floor was full. And they were having us sort of stand intentionally in y'all's way as you were trying, and it felt like a football practice. You know, you guys were like running routes around us. Oh my God. Wow. I don't even remember that, but you're totally right because that would have been helpful. Because when you get, how many people were on the floor? I wonder. I I don't, I have no context. It was uh, Yeah. I mean, I, I, we were between 200 and 225. Um, That's a because lot. I remember I was pushing it. I was pushing it. <laughs> um, uh, like, oh, we could do more. We could do more. Oh my God. No, but it was so fun. And and that first night when we had a full audience or or whatever, our first, you know, I my memory is so bad. That first time we had more than just the 20 um, ART staff, um, it changes the whole thing. You're like, whoa. And then we had a pre-show thing where we all came out. Do you remember this? Like within that pre-show and we just were hanging out. Yeah. In character and also just as audience members and people like um just chilling with the audience which was kind of a great way to acclimate yourself to okay who's here how much it, how large mm -hmm. is this crowd like how are we feeling this out we probably went out like 10 i want to say 10 minutes before the show started i remember this right because didn't mj sort of become mj rodriguez like she sort of became like a hype hype man this fight or right? she was like getting everyone fired up laying out the ground rules for the night right exactly which was i think something that came two or three her two or three performances in because we were learning like Oh, folks don't understand when the show is starting. Right, exactly. And I think that was sort of the point, which I loved. <laughs> but yeah. it was hard to sort of be like, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we're, we're coming up on, on 1245. So I just want to remind folks, we have a couple um, questions in the Q&A. Um, but if you've got questions, um, please drop them in. Um, and you know, we'll take some time here in the last um, 10 to 15 minutes to, to dive in. Um, but Christina, I just kind of wondered, you know, aside from your gig tonight, um, what, what's on the horizon for you? What's, what's the outlook? What projects are you working on? What are you excited about 
coming up um, as we sort of emerge. Yeah, you know, it's been really interesting. I was telling you before, I I think a lot of us have managed to stay busier than we thought we would, maybe in different ways, mm-hmm. definitely not in the ways that I used to be busy. Um, But um, yeah, it's been a really interesting year of kind of, you know, diving into other aspects of my career as an actor um, that are separate from stage, like voiceover. Like I was saying, I, I, I recorded two full, three full seasons of um, cartoons this, this during this time, which is great. What, what is? <laughs> what, I mean, what, sorry, to What is that process like? Like, what is the what is the difference for you when you're coming into like a cartoon character in a studio? Like, what kind of new freedoms are there? It's so different. I was actually recording uh, a season of Voltron during Burn All Night, so before we would do the I show, remember that. I would go into the studio on um, that main street in Boston. I don't remember. The main street in Boston. I feel like it was, like it was Newberry Street. Yeah, Newberry Street. Like, and yeah. Newberry Street was a studio there. So I recorded a lot of my Voltron stuff there. But um, it's so different. I mean, I create the voice based on the audition. But when you do cartoons, you're just by yourself. I just say my lines to my with the engineer there and with the voice director and like, you know, Netflix or Disney or whoever I'm working with on the phones. And you do the line three, you do an ABC and... You go on, you move on to the next line. And it comes out two years later, by the way. Like, I don't hear about it for two years. And then two years comes goes by and I'm like, oh, yeah, I did an entire season of Pantheon on AMC. Haven't thought about that in two years. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess probably because the animation is trying to, like, catch up to your inflection and, like, represent right. your, right? Exactly. So, and also half the time I don't see the character until ADR happens two years later. So, um, I don't even know what I look like. It's really fun that day you see your little animation guy for the first time and you're like, oh my God, cool. Um, which is great. Yeah. Um, and then I, I just finished and wrapped on a movie that I was shooting, which I can't tell you what movie it is, but it's going to be so great. And the theater, everyone that loves theater will love it so much. I'm so excited about it. Um, and then, uh, I'm going to Raleigh to do songs for a new world at um, North Carolina. Oh man. Which I'm so excited about because I've never done it. And I can't wait to sing that music. It's so, oh my, it's just like kind of mind blowing score. Mind blowing. I'd never really worked Mm -hmm. on it. Um, I've heard it of course, but to really learn it and hear the intricacies of the harmonies and like, um, I'm really, really excited about that. So I'll go do that in July and then a couple other things coming up, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. That'd be cool too. It, it, because it, I would imagine it's a beast to perform because songs in the world is just like a million genres. They're, it's just like no song is the same. Totally. Right. Totally. So like you have to be on top of your business. I know. And it's fast. We only have, I think we have like a week and a half of rehearsals and then we're in performance. So it's really fast. And so we're all sort of learning it on our own before we go. Um, so it's good. It's sort of throwing me back. I'll, I will have not been on stage until like, this will be the first time I'll be on stage in, you know, a year and a half. Um, and let alone singing an entire score of a musical. So I'm a little bit like, oh my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when are those dates again? Or where where can people look that up if they happen to be in North Carolina at the time? Yeah, um, it's at North Carolina, the- it's with Eric Woodall. It's his theater company there. Um, and it's, I think our performances are last week of July. We close on August 1st. Cool. Yeah, check it out. So I'm so pumped to sing again and be on stage. I think we're in, yeah, we're in a theater. So I know I've been in some like creative team meetings for shows we have coming up and like seeing prelim scene designs, which are just like, right. (laughs) Just again. Digging back in. So excited. Oh my gosh. So excited. So that's kind of what's on the docket for me. Um, You know, it's been fun to sort of, you know, just stay busy and, I've kind of made, I've made the year and a half the best that I could. I'm sure all of us have, you know, ups and downs, but yeah, it's been okay. And you know, Sarah in a flash in the chat for folks um, with a link to the show page. So check it out folks. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, um, so we have some questions coming in here in the Q and A. Um, and first, um, ART has helped us all grow. How do you continue with this kind of dialogue? Um, I think that I'm assuming sort of the dialogue around like the relationship with the audience and 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 keeping the, the sort of investigation around the theater going. Um, I wonder, Christina, like you know, there's often like a wall between I think institution and artists sometimes, and how to have this conversation. And and I know we've been really interested in kind of breaking that down this year and like 
bringing artists who've worked with us a lot into the conversation with the staff to sort of think about this collectively. And, and I wonder if you've had some of those opportunities or been in conversations with folks other than actors, you know, other artists, other kind of institutions about the work ahead. Yeah, I think it's on, you know, um, beautifully and also it timing like needed it's on everybody's minds um i've you know i've listened to a lot of conversations you know even mean girls like before we posted closing notice the broadway company we had been on you know very regular zooms as a full company with our full producing team full creative team everybody associated um all the folks associated with the show and um those dialogues and those conversations are happening and i think a lot of the time um what I always like to tell people that aren't necessarily immersed in the 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 community right now or yet, um, as you're joining it or as you're pursuing it, or even as a fan that's just watching from the outside, those conversations are happening, and um, they're not publicized. They're very private within the com- within, but those walls are mm. being broken down. Um, but it's a very sensitive. A lot of the conversations are very sensitive, very personal, and people are you know, even Mean Girls specifically, people were allowed to say what they wanted in front, you know, and not be afraid of repercussions of that and 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 be comfortable talking about what they needed to talk about as a human being, not as an employee. Uh, yes, also in the context of being an employee, but not as an actor who wants their job and, and or as, you know, just an openness that allowed for reflection in this in many ways. And I'm hoping um, that that continues, I think it will. And then on the artistic side, I haven't been a lot in a lot of those conversations yet because I haven't been in development of a new show quite yet, other than a couple of Zoom readings that you know didn't need that in that moment. Um, I I foresee that being part of this from now on, just a little bit more openness and availability to to say if you're uncomfortable or say if something isn't working for a certain reason and not be afraid of. I don't know, like what that means for you as an actor. And I think that's good. And even as a writer or any person on the creative side of all of this. Um, so those conversations are happening and they've been really positive in the context that I've had them. Yeah, I think I think you're so right about, in particular what you were saying about like bringing, the full, bringing your full humanity into a conversation. And um, we often get sort of logged in these roles of like, this is the performer, this is the audience member, this is the you know, usher, and that those have some sort of specific uh, uh, rules around them. And I think for us, you know, we've always been thinking artistically about how the audience is a partner, but I think now we're we're thinking much more about it in the entire culture of what it means to be a part of ART and be in the ART universe. Um, And I think the audiences are going to see that showing up a lot more that um, as much as like we are deeply in conversation and in action uh, institutionally around um, really centering anti-racism and really thinking about what that means throughout, uh, the audience is going to be part of that as well. And there's going to be expectations, right? Like when we're all in that room together in a place happening, we're all still humans. There's, we all still have responsibility to one another, regardless of performing, observing, work, any of those things, right? Exactly. And I think on, you know, I think on the performance side and the development side and, and putting up a show it's very stressful. There's a lot of things going on. A lot of the times you have time constraints and money constraints, and there's a lot of stresses that go into creating these shows that our audiences see on stage. Um, And I think that now we will have, we will, no matter the circumstances, that will be a priority that always comes with, no matter how busy it is or how crazy it feels, um, that we take the time to connect, like you said, like using more of our humanity versus like a bottom line. Um, and I hope that that kind of is in every, I hope that's a new thing that happens in every career and every workplace. And, you know, we have an added responsibility because we're sharing a lot with a lot of people, um, literally, but I, I hope that everybody can slow down and take a second to just remember that we're all human beings. And, um, I, I, I foresee that happening more. Um, I know it's not going to be perfect yet. And there's going to be people that are not on board with that. Um, but I think that they're going to, they're going to be met with a lot of resistance um, if if that is, because it's time. Yeah, it's time. It's necessary. It's going to happen. So yeah. time to get on the, get on the same, the same page. Exactly. <laughs> um, I wonder, you know, um, there's a couple other fun questions popping up here in the q and I, I wonder, um, 
in this developmental conversation, right? Um, I also just think about the unique position performers are in to like have that instrument and voice to, to really enhance something. Can you think about a time, especially working in so many musicals that are in this like top rock world, where you've just like seen something on the page and you're like, that's super exciting, but I'm about to riff the hell out of this and blow, like, this is like setting me up for this like, thing I'm about to pull on people that they're not even ready for. You know? oh my- <laughs> well, you know, it's like, it's always that balance of like, again, depending on where, what the situation is. I, I like, it's such a good question. I don't like taking like, too, taking it too far too soon. What sure. I like writers, like, just do whatever you want on this. And I'm like, great. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> um, but usually, you know, again, unless you have the time, like where you're really like diving in and people are like, Oh, what would you, you know, do with this? Whatever. Um, I do like when I see something on the page and I'm like, I could nail that. That's how I felt about um, uh, that last song in We Live in Cairo. Oh, I know. Oh, that song is so good. And I remember when I got the music in auditions, I was like, I have never heard anything like this. I can't wait. Like going into the auditions for that lab, I was so excited to be able to sing that. And I was like, I know that I'm going to like, I connected to it culturally and for so many reasons, it gave me chills. I was like, when I see a piece of music like that, it's why I do this. It's so exciting. Um, and to, you know, bring it to life. That's what I love about, like, I keep saying this development, development, development. I get to bring that to life for people for the first time sometimes, or, you know, in a way that they didn't think about it before. Um, and that's amazing. And that's why the rooms are so great because you get, you know, I get to interpret it in, the way that I see it on the page, but then I get to learn about it from the people that created it, who know it the best. Um, and so it's that like combination that's just like total magic, um, total magic for me. I'm so glad you brought up that finale on Wait on the Pyro because that thing, that song like haunts me <laughs> in so many ways because I don't know, it's, in so many of these musicals we get like, in particular, if it's a dramatic musical, we can like be left in despair, sort of not knowing what's going to happen to the characters, seeing them at an all-time low and just like so worried about their future i feel like those lyrics in that song that were just like i will rise and dress oh. um i am here we are here like we live here it's, we have to move forward it just felt like not joyous <laughs> um but just this like sense of like time moves forward and things have to continue because we have to move forward with them I'm still like, I'm so devastated. I didn't get to see it when you guys did it because I was like, there's got to be a way for me to be able to see this. Um, but I just loved that piece so much. And I think that is a good example of, again, talking and doing shows that maybe you wouldn't think about, like a show about the, resi- you know, the resistance in Egypt, like, and again, having like the, I'd never been in a room full of Middle Eastern artists. Like that was so powerful for me at that time. Like, mm-hmm go home and like literally cry I was like I've never experienced this before um and that as a Leb- like half Lebanese person I was so um just overjoyed by that and I I I'm very sad I never got to see it but the pictures looked amazing <laughs> <laughs> it, it look it certainly um it, it will have I'm not breaking any news I don't know anything those watching so don't get too excited but it will certainly have another life I, I have great faith in that because it's just um it's it's too good not to so good um and okay. has questions like i'm an open book like throw them in there i'm serious like if yeah ask- this question is kind of fun <laughs> this person says this isn't a deep question um but what is your favorite costume you've ever worn oh my god great question again before mean girls i've i was always in sneakers and street clothes because i've just always been in like the punky <laughs> musical spring awakening no i was in like you know dresses and stuff but um my favorite costume is my Gretchen Wieners costumes because I don't dress like that. Like I'm always in like just jeans and a t-shirt or whatever. Mm-hmm. And to dress up and wear like these big heels and like, you know, I felt kind of like a Barbie doll and I don't really operate that way as Christina. And it was the first time I really got to like depart from like sort of everything that like, I'm super hyper. That's how I connect with Gretchen. Like when I'm, you know, really excited about something and I'm very anxious as is Gretchen. But other than that, like, I don't. And so to put on the wig and all the makeup and the clothes, I was like, whoa, this is that moment, like as an actor where you forget, like I'm playing a character that's not me. And I think it's really fun. (laughs) 
Um, I just but I think I can take it home, which now people are going to think, I wish I could take your Gretchen Wieners costumes home, <laughs> which is not. Would you like to Sarah was Sarah was like asking me if I needed something. I was like, no, I think we're good. So <laughs> hilarious live theater faux pas. Um, anyway, <laughs> I don't, don't quite know how to recover for that. Now I'm really embarrassed. Oh my God. Um, uh, yeah, great. Oh, now Sarah's saying it was just to the panelists. The audience didn't see it, but now I've revealed myself. Everyone, I'm a mess. Don't Mark. <laughs> don't pay attention to me. Um, so uh, okay, so we talked about costumes, uh, but I had a question because I didn't see Lazarus. So that was like a just street clothes sneakers. Oh yeah, that was so fun, Lazarus. Yeah. For attendees of this, I, Lazarus was um, David Bowie's final work um, before he passed away. And um, was one of the coolest things I've ever gotten to do. Um, I did the development of that before we did it at New York Theater Workshop. And um, got to work with the legend. I can't even say The fact that I even get to say that I got to work with David Bowie is still, like, insane. Um, And uh, it was just incredible. It was so cool to um, be involved in this thing. And he always said, like, he loved musicals. And he would tell us this and they were really powerful to him. And just to hear somebody like that connect to, you know, sometimes I feel like our musical theater world feels so like, like, okay, like we're this special club and like, you know, like, I don't know, but the, to hear David Bowie be like, I loved, he listened to a lot of musicals mm. um, and he it was very important to him that we did the off Broadway recording of that with our cast that we were. Um, and uh, we recorded that album that you can listen to on Spotify on the day um that he died which is so crazy because we didn't know that he was ill he was still at opening night like he was an opening night was like a couple of weeks before that so it was pretty crazy and he was just an incredible person and um it was a really cool show really weird as it should be it's david bowie <laughs> yeah i mean um sorry i didn't get into that story sooner because um Sarah, being a big fan of Bernal Knight, is a gigantic... I, I haven't met a bigger David Bowie fan in my life. Um, so now Sarah's You're probably an even cool. bigger <laughs> super, fan, super fan of yours. Yeah, but he was so awesome. And um, it was just amazing. And I got to do that show with um, Michael C. Hall. He played the, mm. the lead and he was incredible. And I was a huge fan of his. So I was like, oh my God, Michael C. Hall. He's amazing. Yeah. But that was a great experience. But again, like, that's why I was saying my, my career has sort of been in these, like, in this sp very specific world of musical theater. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm so happy that I now know what it's like to be in a big commercial mu musical comedy. It's very different. <laughs> um, we did get another question, which is, is, a, is a good one. I think this is probably the question that'll really take us out. Um, and Clarissa is asking, how do you get voiceover work or work outside of traditional shows? Yeah. I think for anyone pursuing this, um, you know, in any context, um, it's important to remember that there's a lot of different, like I was saying before, there's a lot of different, you know, uh, places that you can go that are, you know, more than just on stage. And also it's important if, you know, I told myself when I first started this, I, that I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to act and perform. And what is that going to mean when there's only, you know, a certain amount of Broadway shows that I'm right for in a season or that I'm castable in and also just auditioning for Broadway shows are hard and it's really competitive and at literally every time I bow I think the theater gods that I even get to be on a Broadway stage um it's a little miracle that I've gotten to do them and so mm. I think that with that I want to perform I want to do what I do and so with that I thought about voiceover and I you know worked towards that and on camera was always really important to me which I'm continuing to push and pursue um as well and um and coaching and things and my YouTube mm -hmm. channel so I just I want my career to be really full of a lot of things and not feel like I am grasping and desperate for one certain thing to happen um because that doesn't make it fun and also it's it's there's just too, you know, there's so much other things that you can do. So um, I love that because now I get to perform all the time. You know what I mean? Um, but it takes a lot of work and it took a lot of focus. And, um, you know, the voiceover world is its own world that has nothing to do with anything we do. And so it's a completely mm -hmm. other. It took years of pursuit and um, work in that field as well. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's also that like expansive reach, right? Like sometimes the problem with theaters, you have to be 
at the place. The, the, the beauty and the, the restriction of theater is you have to be there to experience it. Right, and exactly. Having these other ways to, to have the reach is great. Yeah. So it's fun. I like doing it all. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's one o'clock, if you can believe it, or I guess uh, 11 o'clock where you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the next time talking to you, Mark, and Eric. Yes. Yeah. It's so good to have you. I'm so looking forward to, you know, now we can see each other in New York in person and, and catch up. It will be great. Wait. Um, and break a leg tonight at the at the Diamondbacks game. Thank you. I'm a little nervous, but it'll be great. <laughs> yeah, it'll be awesome. Um, thank you all for joining today. Thanks for watching um, and getting to see my hilarious Zoom chat antics. Um, and I hope you join us next week. Um, our final episode for this year um, will be in a great conversation with Kevin Lynn, Maddie Burson, Ari Barbanel, um, with Diane Borger. Um, and this Diane Borger um, heads, uh, heads back to London we'll, and be in a great conversation about mentorship um, and sort of what it means to uh, impart knowledge and, and wisdom uh, uh, down through, through, um, through our colleagues. So I hope you'll join us for that. It's going to be very exciting. Um, and Christina, thank you again for being here today. Thank you for having me. That was so fun, Mark. Absolutely. All right. Bye, friends. Have a good rest of your Tuesday. <laughs>